Hallelujah, hallelujah. Blessed day of the Lord to everyone. You're welcome to the King Scott Bible Teaching, Prayer, and Leadership Development Service. Uh, we started off uh, a subject on Sunday that we titled The Kingdom Church in a Politicized World. And uh, we're going to go into part two today and hopefully run it up on Sunday, coming Sunday with part three. Let's start off with prayers. Lord, we give you praise. Thank you for access into your presence thank you lord for your word is a lamp onto our feet and a light onto our path to keep us from walking in darkness even as we go through this maze called life with all the ups and downs intricacies complexities and things thrown at us on a daily basis if only your people would look back to your word and glean wisdom from your word and allow the light of your words to guide us to be the lamp onto our feet and the light onto our path and to allow your spirit order our course and direct our path even like proverbs 3 8 talks about in all our ways to acknowledge you and you will direct our path so many pools much pressure but you will keep in perfect peace all those whose hearts are stayed on you and it's our choice it's our desire lord that our hearts are stayed on you the kingdom church will desire for for it to stay aligned with you always so again as your word goes forth today we thank you holy spirit for understanding for clarity thank you for helping us all especially those who will be under the sound of our voice and, and we'll listen or watch this in, in the days to come, that we do not get into this topsy-turvy, back and forth roller coaster ride that leads to nowhere, but that will make you our due north. You'll become our the one who establishes us, who stabilizes us, because you are called the rock eternal rock of ages we we're founded on that rock and so we will not be moved so holy spirit thank you glorify jesus and we say amen and amen and amen again welcome to the king scott bible teaching prayer and leadership development service so we're going to continue where we left off on sunday the kingdom church in a politicized world the kingdom church in a politicized world <clears throat> So again, the purpose of this message is to address what we believe is a negative trend in modern times that seems to have overtaken the church as well. It's a sort of fever or frenzy that happens during especially political presidential general elections. We saw this during the US presidential elections in 2020 and the same has been true for some other parts of the world since after then, and most recently in Nigeria. They all have a similar outcome. And what is that? The satisfaction of masses of people in the officially announced election results. This by no means you know, gives validity to the officially announced result. No, we're not, we're not saying it's correct. We're not saying it's true. Whichever the case, whether it's in the US, whether it's elsewhere in the world or in Nigeria, we're not endorsing any of that. But what we're saying, what we are focusing on is the fact that it, there is a this dissatisfaction of masses of people in what is officially announced as the election results. And this, of course, has led to and does lead to agitations, distrust, litigations on end that never end as well as civil unrest and violence in some places and you must understand for those who operate democracy trust is a major foundation of democracy when trust is eroded in a democratic process then it might as well degenerate to anarchy and we pray god forbid so again the church has a role to pray that these things do not generate and not become an enabler to that process of degenerating to anarchy. So the church must take its place and know its true place in these matters. Now, of course, election results and the alleged 
whatever is alleged that goes with it should not come as a surprise. Should not come as a surprise because for one, uh, the, 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 the process is flawed. We all know that. The process is flawed and um, <clears throat> it is run by humans and the thing what, what humans run certainly will come with issues. So you expect issues to rise up with whatever humans uh, you know, do. So it's not a perfect system. Scriptures also foretold of the turmoil of nations. Scriptures told us of what will become of nations in the days to come. And it, it, it sums it up in the phrase turmoil of nations, but it, it even gets worse than that. And this is to prepare God's people. This is to prepare God's people. We're heading, you know, I know some preachers preach wonderful things, great things, and my goodness, I hope they are correct. But when you look at scriptures, that's not what you see. When you look at scriptures, that is not what you see. Whether it's the Lord Jesus in Matthew 24, or even going back in time, in the days of Daniel, right? Daniel uh, uh, chapter nine and from nine going on down to uh, and so on and so forth, right? Or, or is it Ezekiel? Is it Jeremiah? Is it the prophets? Is it Isaiah? The prophecies to nations, all right? And then finally, in the book of Revelation, scriptures don't speak of these wonderful things that, so the expectation of people on political processes or democratic processes sometimes is unfounded. It's not, real, it's not realistic. Isaiah declared you have for, forsaken the fountain of living waters and you've made for yourself broken cisterns that can hold no water. You rejected the prince of peace and then you cry foul play on the other side. What are you expecting? So we, we should expect this thing. And the Bible foretold them not only the turmoil of nations, but also the groanings of the earth itself. So we're coming to a time where the earth itself will begin to groan. Whether it's out of age, aging, the aging process, or human activity, whatever the case, where the Bible did prophesy this thing. So we've got to be ready for them. But the focus of this message is on the church of Jesus Christ and how these things impact us. What should be the posture and position of the kingdom church? And I'm more specific with the kingdom church because I understand there is a church that is not the church of Jesus Christ. So just because it's called church doesn't mean it's the church of Jesus Christ. Jesus told us, and we're going to look more into that on Sunday, I will build my church. So there's a church he calls his church. We're going to see what he meant by that and what to expect in his kind of church or the church he calls his church. So that church that is called the church of Jesus Christ, what should be our posture and our position in a politicized world? What should be the posture and position of the kingdom church in a politicized world? And by the way, that should also affect kingdom people because kingdom people make up kingdom churches. And that is you and me, people who have Christ, who ascribe to the kingship and the lordship of Jesus Christ, who are filled with his Holy Spirit and who do his will and follow the order of God. Not those who say one thing and do another thing, all right? So should the church of Jesus Christ, which of course is represented by the local houses of worship all over the world, should the church of Jesus Christ immerse itself into the politics of the host communities, whether it's a city, whether it's a, a country, or whether it's a nation or a region? Should the church of Jesus Christ immerse? Now, the word immerse means to be submerged. It's like to be like baptizing. So you're all the way in into it. Should the church of Jesus Christ be immersed into the politics of its host communities? Should the prophetic muscle, the prophetic ministry, should it be directed to determining outcomes of political processes? The question, it, it, you know, the, the, the question must be answered. Are political processes divine processes? Are political processes God's method? Okay, is God a partisan politi politician or is he involved in human, in the politics of the people? We've got to answer these questions. <clears throat> so this message comes to draw our attention to three things. 
And we started off number one on Sunday, which is understanding and categorizing prophecies of national significance. Because when you make a prophecy that has national implication, you're dealing with, my goodness, you're dealing with millions of people. You're dealing with people of different ethnicities, especially in a multi-ethnicity country, a, a multi-ethnic country. You're dealing with people of different cultural backgrounds, different religious belief systems, you know, different uh, worldviews and all of that. And then you give one singular prophetic word to affect all of them. You got to weigh that. You've got to wait. All right. So we must begin to understand how to categorize prophecies of such magnitude. When prophecies are given to individuals, that's a different ball game. When prophecies are given to families, that's a different story. When prophecies are given to even different people groups, that's a different story. Because there's a commonality. There's a shared commonality amongst them, right? When prophecies are given to entities and, and, and you know, say organizations and stuff like that, or, or, or bodies, corporate bodies, that's it because they are bound by a singular vision, all right? But when you now give a prophecy over a nation, especially a multi-ethnic, multi-racial, multi-religious nation, ooh, we got to weigh that thing. We got to weigh that thing. How does God rule amongst even people who don't want him to be king? We will not have this man rule over us. Does he impose himself upon them? The next one we're going to look at also today, revisiting critical divine prophecies that apply to human existence. So when you're dealing with prophecies to nations or prophecies of national magnitude, well, remember, there are also prophecies that affect all of humanity. So in the scale of preference, in the scale of uh, magnitude, which comes first? Which, which is of more importance? Which is of more uh, 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 critical nature? I would say the prophecy that pertains to all of humanity or human existence is weightier. And so even national prophecy, excuse me, <coughs> prophecies to nations, <coughs> prophecies to nations, people groups, and what have you, will definitely come under prophecies to the entire world or prophecies to humans as you know, living entities on planet Earth. <coughs> And then on Sunday, by God's grace, we're going to talk about revisiting our divinely ordained call and, and, and identity. Who are we? Who, 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 what does scripture say about who we are? And what does scripture say about what we are called to do? When we know what we're called to do, the next question is, are we really doing that? What, what, when it comes to immersing ourselves into politics, do we have scriptures that say to do that? We're going to see all that. All right, so we started this on Sunday, understanding and categorizing prophecies of national significance or magnitude, uh, but we're still going to talk about it uh, some more today. <clears throat> so when you're dealing with prophecies that are of national magnitude, we can look at it from three perspectives or three categories. Uh, the first is what I call eternal purposes, eternal purposes. The next is what I call divine intent. And the last is what I call divine assistance. All right. So the first one is eternal purpose or eternal purposes. What do you mean by those? Those are prophecies that are of eternal purposes are those that are solely of God, solely dependent upon God. <clears throat> Human acquiescence or human assistance is not required. God solely does what God wants to do, which he has predetermined in his counsel, in his eternal wisdom. He orchestrates by his eternal power, by his sovereignty, by his will. The, the song that, you know, that was sung in Revelation, you made all things and for your pleasure, by your will, they exist. So his will, brought about existence. No human was consulted about that. We saw that on Sunday. But today I want to show a different text. When you look at Micah chapter 5 verse 2, which is also repeated in Acts chapter 2 verse 6, it declares through the word of a prophet, Micah, but you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are little 
among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. <clears throat> So in this prophecy in, in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, which was repeated in Acts chapter 2, we see a prophecy of eternal purpose. How do we know that? It pertains to God. He it said, it's of, it's of me. It's me doing this. But then this prophecy of eternal purpose specifically mentions a geographical location on the earth, Bethlehem in Judah. When you read Acts 2, verse 6, that's what he calls it, Bethlehem in Judah. So there are prophecies of eternal value, eternal weight that reveal what God is doing or what God wants to do in specific geographical locations. And we can weigh prophecies to know which falls into that category. So if God would choose to raise up a Messiah, Mashiach, from Bethlehem of Judah, who knows what he's doing in, in, the, in the nations of the earth? <clears throat> Could he also reveal through his prophets what he's doing in a particular nation? Absolutely. Just the very fact that you have the congregation of people, especially people of God, in a particular geographical location is enough uh, 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 reason to expect that God is doing something in their midst. If you can have personal prophetic words, then you can have, uh, you know, an, a, you know, a prof prophetic word regarding a geographical space. Now, whether it pertains to the whole nation, it's not the question, but I mean, what God does in that nation may not affect the entire nation, but it have, for the sake of his people in that nation, God could be doing something in that nation. All right? So we can know when the prophecy comes forth, is this, a, is this a prophecy of an eternal purpose? Is this something the eternal one has decided to accomplish? Or is it just meddling in human affairs? The second uh, category is divine intent. <clears throat> And prophecies that relate to divine intent are those that reveal God's desire. You see the difference? There is eternal purpose, but now it's an intent. There's a divine intent. There's a, there's a divine desire, God's desire, God's will, God's plan, God's best for people, which could be a nation, which could be a people group, which could be a community. So if the nation or some people, individuals in the nation, or even one single prophet were to ask God, God, what is your plan for our nation? He could say, this is what I wish. This is what I think. This is what I'm planning. This is my intent. This is what I would love to see happen. In fact, let me show you the future. Let me take you to the future. And God has done that. Take prophets to the future and show them a, 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 a preferred future. Does that mean that future will be? It depends on the people. Because there is a way to get there. It's like embarking on a journey, right? You cannot get on a flight going to, uh, for instance, uh, uh, Dubai <clears throat> and say, okay, uh, Israel, here I come. You can be saying that, but sure enough, you're not going to Israel because the flight you're boarded is going to Dubai. So when the preferred future is revealed, there is a cause. There's a predetermined, predefined course to get to that future. If the people choose not to walk or follow that course, then they will not get to that preferred future. So God's intent is what he will see, what he would love to see happen. From his wisdom, from his, you know, uh, 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 foreknowledge, that's the word I'm looking for. From his foreknowledge, from his foreknowledge, he knows what is best. But people have a will. People have a choice in the matter. People can say yes to God or no to God. So the people must acknowledge, agree with, and co-labor with God to make this happen. So if God were to say, this is the man I would love for you to make president. All nation, vote this one. If you vote this one, this will happen to your nation. And that's perfectly okay. The nation can say, we don't, we don't care. No, we don't like him. He's not from our tribe. He doesn't speak our language. He didn't go to the school we want him to go to. He's not as educated. He's not part of the boys club, blah, 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 blah. He doesn't have money. And all what's, whatever excuses humans give. But that's God's intent, God's purpose. And ministers need to know that. Prophets need to know that. 
prophet stand in the place to reveal the mind of God. That is the office of the prophet, to reveal the mind of God, but not to impose the mind of God, to reveal the mind of God. You cannot tell humans what they're going to do, what they must do. That is going into another realm of, you know, divination actually. Because God gives humans free choice, free will. Adam and Eve is a good example. He knew where they were going and they warned them, don't do that. Cain, he told Cain, sin lies at the door and his desire is towards you. But I'm counseling you, don't go that way, Cain. Come this way. Go quickly, get a good offering. You know what I want. Get an offering, sacrifice, do it, and you will be accepted. Did God impose on Cain? No. So, but if you go the way of, Cain, of, of sin, this is what's going to happen. That's God for you. So God will show you outcomes of your choices, but it's not going to impose it on you, let alone a nation of divided people. <clears throat> And an example of divine intent we see in 1 Samuel 16, verse 6 to 8. This is a very interesting uh, verse, uh, you know, story of script of the, of the Bible. So this is Samuel in the house of Jesse to make David, to anoint David, the, the next king of Israel. Verse 6, so it was when they came that he, Samuel, looked at Eliab and said, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. <laughs> But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because watch this, I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Oh my God, I wish we can understand that. Verse 8, so J.C. called Abinadab, and made Abinadab pass before Samuel. And Samuel said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. What's going on here? So we see here that the prophet's preference came to play. Initially, the, the prophet had his own preference and his preference played into his prophetic grace. <clears throat> his preference played into his prophetic anointing. And not only played into his prophetic anointing, but he actually imposed it on God. Surely, when you say surely, you're saying this is, it can, it cannot, it, there is no mistaking. This is it. And that's something I've seen in a lot of prophets too, you know, who, who see visions and, you know, have to, they come with that note of final finality. They come with that note, conclusive note of finality. If it doesn't happen, call me a first person. You don't have to say that. You don't have to do all of that. You're not a prophet because your prophetic words are accurate. That's the one makes you a prophet. You're a prophet because God called you to be a prophet. Simple. That's it. That's it. That's it. You're not a prophet because your words are accurate. You're not a prophet because your visions are accurate. You're not a prophet because your predictions come to pass. Because if you go by that standard, then false prophets also qualify. If you go by that standard, then necromancers People who use familiar spirits and, and, and muttering spirits and all of that will also qualify. As a matter of fact, Balaam was a very good one. Did you go back to Bal uh, um, uh, Balaam's, Balaam's words? Oh, my goodness. Balaam was seen way into the future, even before Moses. Moses didn't get to that point. It was later on Moses began to speak about things like that. Where did Balaam get that from? But Balaam was an occultic guy. He knew how to set altars. He knew how to erect seven altars, something you've never seen Moses do. Moses, who was the prophet of the day. So don't go by that. If you're truly a prophet, rest it in the hand of God. And by the way, when you give what you believe is uh, <clears throat> the word of the Lord, leave it alone. Let the word be its own defender. You don't, don't do that. If I be a prophet, it's up to you whether you believe you or not. Okay, we're not, we're not going to go by whether your word is true or not. If you're truly, you shouldn't be saying that. So you see the prophet saying, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. So he, he in his mind, he already confirmed Eliab was the anointed of God. Are you seeing that? And he posed, imposed it on God. So again, this goes to some folks who usually say, eh, if you're truly a prophet, you will not miss it. You will not miss it. All the prophets of old were sharp. They didn't miss it. Well, I just showed you one. And there are many others. I've always told people who say that that's not true. And by the way, all you see in the Bible are the times they got it right. You know, <laughs> the Bible doesn't record everything as they said, because all you hear is in the 13th year of King Ahasuerus, you know, the word of the Lord came to prophet so-and-so, and he declared, thus says the Lord, and it came to pass. 
13th year, I have a first year, second year, third year, fourth year. What was that prophet doing? You don't know. So scriptures only highlight the ones that the Lord himself, again, going to eternal purposes or the one the Lord impressed upon them. But a prophet sees, a prophet hears, a prophet knows, a prophet interacts with the things of the spirit. Sometimes interpretation becomes the problem. Interpretation becomes a challenge. And by the way, can I submit to you that even as a prophet, your level of interpretation of what you see is dependent on how much of the word of God you have. So if you're a prophet of God and you don't know the word of God to the degree that you should, even what you see can be blurry vision to you. <clears throat> your interpretation of what you see could be off, could be wrong because you've not dug it. And so a lot of prophets ride on the coattail of your prophetic grace but they don't spend time in the word. You must be a word prophet. And then there are prophets who relegate themselves to Old Testament patterns. Please understand, prophets in the New Testament are quite different from prophets in the Old Testament. We have come into a new covenant, and so we must bear the new covenant or become representatives of that new covenant. What does it mean to be a prophet in the new covenant? You got to find that out. That's the, my message today. <clears throat> So we see the prophet's own persuasion, preference came to play, and he tried to impose it on God. This is the Lord. He's the Lord's anointed, and the Lord's tapping. Uh -uh. Now, I don't know if he spoke that out, because if he spoke it out, then he would have made a false prediction about who was to win this, not election, but selection, because this is a divine selection. It was a theocracy. This is a divine selection, not an election. So he would have prophesied wrongly. Samuel would have prophesied wrongly. Eliab should be the anointed one. And God said, no, Samuel, I didn't say that. But it didn't stop there. Uh, also observe that uh, 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 um, JC pushed his, the other son. So this must be the son of his own choice, the son that he wanted. I thought I had it up there. Looks like, oh, right there, yeah. So JC pushed his favorite on the prophet as well. So JC's favorite must have been Abinadab. If I go and read the Bible, say he made him, made him pass. Because the young man may have said, ah, if God has rejected all five, <laughs> why am I going? Please, let, I'm the least. What? I mean, uh, Jesse said, no, you got to go. Jesse made Abinadab go through the line. <coughs> and someone said, no, neither has the Lord chosen this one. So the Lord rejected both. Now, here is the problem for a democracy. Observe, first and foremost, what God did explaining why he cho chose his position or why he refused these other guys. So I'm looking at their heart. So humans are looking at outward appearance. And when you talk about outward appearance, what are you talking about? You're talking about their physical look. You're talking about their age. You're talking about you know what you know, what may be observed. What may be observed, that's what you mean by outward appearance. Their education, their professional uh, 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 background, you know, history, <clears throat> probably what they've accomplished in the past and so on and so forth. And so you immediately project into the future based on what I see, based on what I know, based on what I've observed. This is what I can expect. God said that's how man looks. If God were to look, he's not looking at all of that. He's looking at the person's heart. So all people who are casting votes, have you seen the heart of the person you're casting your vote for? Have you asked the Lord for their heart? Because the heart matters. The heart is the center of, of a man's, you know, uh, 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 existence. All right. And that is also the problem with a democracy. Because <clears throat> what is interesting here is that no, none of the candidates that were presented was approved by God. That is the interesting thing here. God said, no, all the guys you, you've given, you've select, you've, you know, brought up, none of them meets my standard. In fact, the guy I choose for you is not even here at all. <laughs> that is the limitation of a democracy because a democracy is limited to a number of people. You, you go through your processes and then at the end of the day, a number of people, maybe one or two or so, stand at the top and then the, the nation is told to select from those. What if God says, I don't want any? And by the way, think about it, oh prophet. Does God have to be bound to what the people give to him? Think about it. Must God say something about every election? 
So when the people are, I mean, people buy their way, do all kinds of things, cheat their way through to rise to the top, and then you come, it must be this one. What if God says, I don't want anyone at all? What do you do? So we've got to make that provision as well. What happens when all candidates on the ballot are rejected by God? And, and when we get to the later part of the message, you see why. Because we're told, that I can preempt myself, Revelation 17, verse 9, we're told that the woman who sits over uh, the seven mountains is the abomination of the earth, is mystery Babylon. And when you're talking about the seven mountains, you're talking about the mountains of society, you're talking about the foundational pillars that hold up human society. And yet, a mystery Babylon sits over it. Ah, let's move on. So since the nations operate democratic processes which are flawed, the people could reject divine intent or God's best for them based on the available options. What if God's choice or God's best for you is not even on your ballot to start with? And don't forget, remember they rejected Jesus Christ. They rejected God. In fact, Israel rejected God himself in the person of Samuel, right? We don't want to be ruled by God. So if they rejected God, why do you think they won't reject your offer or whatever you say is God's will for them? Let's think about these things. <clears throat> so God will not force his choice on the people. In a democracy, God's choice is limited to the available options. And we cannot put God in that kind of a bind. Because when you're saying God, show us, it's, it's like uh, uh, the casting of lots that the, the apostles did while they were migrating from the old tradition to the new covenant, right? You know, they had Matthias and they had uh, the other guy and they cast Lot. And God said, I'm not in any of the two at all. <laughs> the guy I've chosen is not even here at all. This is God for you. So I've given you two examples in the Bible. Even in the new covenant, so to speak, the apostles still depending on old traditions. Lord, thou who knowest the hearts of all men. That's, that's the mistake, actually. If you know God knows the hearts of all men, then you should be asking him, Lord, reveal your heart or reveal the hearts of this man rather than casting lots. They had Matthias and the other guy, I can't remember his name now. And God said, none of the two. None of the two. The guy I'm chosen, I've chosen for the position is not even here yet. He won't even show up until later down the road. And that's Paul for the apostleship. That's the way of God. So when people try to bind God to the, the dregs of society, the ones corrupt leaders whom you have chosen by your democratic process, it's okay, God, choose one. Choose one out of the four, really. How do you bind God to that kind of a thing? <clears throat> so the prophet can only speak of God's choice or the outcomes of rejecting God's choice. Or you can paint a picture of the, of the, 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 the choice person. You don't have to say it's this one or that one. The kind of person that God wants for you, old nation, is a person of these, of these, of these, of these, of these. See that? And then if the people don't want that, well, unfortunately, this is what's going to happen. So you also reveal what's going to happen for rejecting the choice of God. But the prophet should never impose or purport to know what the people are going to do. It's a democracy. You can't tell with all the rigmarolling and all the stuff that goes on with it. All right. So the next one is divine assistance. The third category is divine assistance. So prophecies that you know relate to divine assistance are those that involve divine intervention divine intervention in the state of affairs if and when God's people earnestly pray for it. I know some of the prophets who spoke about the Nigerian prophetic, uh, Nigerians as a, a political situation kept saying, if you pray, if you pray, I will do this. And that's how prophecy goes. That's how you know a mature prophet. If you pray, this is what I'll do. So it's a conditional thing, and it's always that's divine intent. Divine intent is conditional. If you pray, don't get involved in the point, don't tie yourself with the politics of the nation. Become the church I've called you to be. Don't settle for political power. There is power in you as church. If you pray, this is what I would do. Did, did, did they pray? No, it looks to me like they already knew what God wanted for them. 
a lot of the ministers, even the big time ministers in the nation, Nigeria more specifically, seem to know where God wants to go. And so kept imp imposing, this is, it has to be this one, it has to be this one. But God says, I have a greater need that you know nothing of. There is a meat that I am hungry of that you know nothing of. Your nation needs this, and that's what I want to give you, which we saw some of it in, my, in the last message uh, Wednesdays. Unity. Unity is one of the things the Lord mentioned. All nation of Nigeria, the Lord will say to you, your first problem is unity. You're not united. And whenever these things happen, your tribalism comes up. So tribalistic. Your tribalism is all, it, it stinks to high heavens. You're not yet a nation. <clears throat> You're not yet a nation. You're still tribal groups trying to forge ahead. You're not yet a nation. You're not bound to a single vision as a nation. And God said, that's what I want to deal with. If you pray, I will tie the north and the south. Unite your nation. Then we can go forward. If you're not united as a nation, why do you expect El Dorado? And when, but when God's people pray, assuming we, we miss divine intent, and then terrible things begin to happen, the church is put on notice or the people of God are under affliction, then the people cry unto God. And this is the bulk of the Bible. This is what you see in the Bible. Israel sinned against the Lord. They went into captivity. They cried on the book of Judges. They cried unto the Lord. The Lord sent a deliverer and delivered them. And then Israel sinned against the Lord and the Lord brought an army of captivity. They took them. Israel cried unto the Lord. The Lord sent a deliverer. And it's just the bulk of scripture. That is what happens all the time. So when people miss God's best for them, and settle for less, you're going to have problems down the road, which will make you cry out to the Lord. So again, God's people must pray. So you who is saying, is it prayer, prayer, prayer? See, you're already missing the mark. That is actually a deception of the enemy <clears throat> to stop you from praying. That's where your strength lies. Your strength is not in the polls. Your strength is on your knees, ministers of God. Your strength is on your knees, children of God. And so in response, God upsets satanic and human and devils. As a matter of fact, speaking of Nigeria, when you look back in, in, in the nation's history, we've had inflection points in our history where God intervened miraculously. Even we didn't pray for it. We didn't even pray for it. There was no prayer sessions going on, but God intervened and spoiled the hand of the enemy, spoiled the plans of the enemy many times in the nation's history. I promise you it will do the same in the future. So even if those who are clamoring for power get there and decide to use it to do nefarious activities, God will arise because his interest is in Nigeria. Put your trust in God, Nigeria, not in man's systems. And so you find that in Job to the fire, I can't read the whole thing for time's sake, but when you read from verse 8 to 16, it pertains to you, and I believe this is prophetic for you, Nigeria, at this point in time. He said, but as for me, I will seek God. I will seek God. And to God, I will commit my cause. Who does great things and unsearchable, marvelous things without number? He gives rain on the earth and sends waters on the fields. He sets on high those who are lowly and those who mourn are lifted to safety. He frustrates the devices of the crafty, hallelujah, so that their hands cannot carry out their plans. This is what you want. This is what you want. He catches the wise in their own craftiness and the counsel of the cunning comes quickly upon them. It falls on their own head. Verse 14, they meet with darkness in the daytime and grope at noontime as in the night. Now look at verse 15. But the Lord saves the needy, the downtrodden, the helpless, from the sword, from the mouth, and from the hand of the mighty, those who want to oppress them, those who want to destroy them, the Lord saves his people from them. Verse 16, so that the poor, the helpless, those who cannot fight for themselves, don't have a voice, can now have hope. And injustice shuts her mouth. So when they want to bring injustice against the people of God, when you pray unto the Lord, divine assistance comes. The divine assistance ensures that God's people will find justice. The mouth of injustice is short and God's people will find hope. This is what we need, God's people. Our place is not to be contending for, you know, who, who wins an election, but to desire for God's divine assistance. 
So again, it's not about who wins an election, it's about what God can do for his people who put their trust in him. Even under terrible administrations, God can move in the behalf of his people. And we've seen that again and again and again. All right, so quickly we'll move to number two. And number two is critical prophecies that apply to human existence. Critical prophecies that apply to humans, uh, humanity, humans' existence. All right. <clears throat> So in this part of the message, we want to look at into some biblical prophecies that apply to humans in general. All humans are affected by this. So when you're talking about national prophecies or prophecies relating to people groups, those come secondary. They come under this. So what God might be doing, and, and I'm saying that because of people who exalt certain people groups or some identity, you know, I'm not going to talk about those, but if you choose to exalt a people group or a race or whatever over some others and give them special privilege, just remember that what God is doing in all of humanity is greater than that, okay? All right, so, and that should address this position, this ideology that certain people are more special. Uh, it used to be certain whites, nice blacks have even started doing the same. Now, some religious groups are doing the same. Some ethnic groups are doing the same. Oh, we're better than those other ones. We are the chosen tribe. We are the chosen race. You know, we are, we are, we are superior and all of that kind of stuff. Whatever you think your, your, your group, your ethnic group, you know, has that is you think is better than others, just remember that uh, your passion for that, uh, for those exclusive privileges, must be framed by God's sovereign agenda. God's sovereign agenda overrides any other agenda for people groups, for nations, and what have you. Here is an example, Genesis 1, 26 to 28. I'm not going to read it. We read it on Sunday, <clears throat> but it talks about let us make humans in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion and all of that. So, But here is our submission based on that. All humans were created by God. Okay. That, that is bottom line. All humans were created by Almighty God. But they are all invited to pursue after the likeness of God. So God made humans for a singular purpose, to be like him, to pursue after his likeness. And that applies to every human on planet Earth. That applies to every race on planet Earth. That applies to every ethnic group on planet Earth. If you are a human being and you were created by God, then you were called to be in the likeness of God. You were called to pursue after the likeness of God. And the refusal to do that is why we have problems in the earth. So this eternal purpose and this vision, observe, was cast before any division of the human race. Adam and Eve being the first man and woman, you could not say they were white, they were black, they were brown, they were red, they were Fulani, they were Igbo, they were Yoruba, they were American, they were Nigerian. You could not say that. They were formed in the Garden of Eden, end of story. They were made by God out of the dust of the earth, breathed into them, became a living soul. We're not told their color. We're not told their race. We're not told the, even the language they spoke. We don't know all of that. And anybody who comes to tell you they know, well, th that's speculation. God made humans from, you know, in his image, rather, made humans in his image. But then the, the desire or the plan of God was for them to be, to pursue after the likeness of God. So you, O oh man of God, who is pointing finger at a different ethnic group, don't you see you're already in the wrong? Because God made them too. God made them too, and God is calling them to be like him as well, right? Now, there are some ideologies that border on the ridiculous, but I'm going to touch them because some people, actually, a number of people are beginning to believe that. There are some ideologies that say that certain people walking the face of the earth today are reptilian creatures uh, in human form. <clears throat> I'm not going to go into whether that's true or not, but here's what I'll say to you. The Bible is so rich, and I want to encourage you, those of you who don't read the Bible, and I'm not even talking about Christians, non-believers, non-Christians, read the Bible. Take your time and read the Bible. Read objectively. Read as any book, any other book. I mean, you sit down and read fictitious books, you know, you know books that you know are not true, and you don't have a problem reading those. Why don't you make the Bible a part of your reading? 
And I say, read from a simpler translation, a read a simpler version and see what you might find out. But the Bible does not leave us clueless as to the existence of creatures other than humans. The Bible speaks largely about these things. So we cannot say that uh, point of view is totally out of this world. We cannot say that because the Bible does speak about you know, certain things that we, 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 we may not fully understand, but it makes, uh, it points us to some of these things, all right? It point, I mean, when you go back to Genesis 6 and all of that, hey, who knows what was going on then, right? Sons of God, sons of women, uh, daughters of the world, we don't. Some people say they are angels, some people say they are demons, some people say they are fellow humans. Okay, I don't know. We're going to find out in days to come, right? But something happened there. Something happened there. We also know the Bible speaks about the spiritual realm where you have demonic spirits that can actually possess people. The Bible talks about that. Now, to what degree do they possess people? We don't know. Could they possess people to the degree that they take over their entire will? We don't know that. But it seems to me that it's possible because some of the people Jesus Christ dealt with their demons were beside themselves. They were totally beside themselves, right? So could it be that certain entities can take over human form or human beings and begin to manip manipulate or use them? The Bible does point to stuff like that. So I'm not going to you know, debate that. But here's what I'm saying. Creation itself is an act of almighty God. All right? Creation. So even when you say reptilian creatures, they too were created. Who created them is, becomes a question. So creation is an act of almighty God. Everything that is was created. Everything that is was created. Again, the song in Revelation, I think Revelation 4. For you have created all things, and by your will they exist, and for your pleasure. All things were created by the Lord God. Now, in the case of humans, the goal is to pursue after the likeness of their maker. So all of God's children should be co-laborers with God to make this a reality. So minister of God, you should not be condemning humans, any humans at all. You should be helping them fulfill the call of God, which is to pursue after the likeness of God. <clears throat> Here is another text, John 3, 16 to 17. This is about salvation. It says, for God so loved, take note, the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever, King James says, whosoever, believes in his son. So whoever means anyone, anyone on the planet, any human being, whether you are Fulani, whether you are formerly and you know, whatever, you raised up Islam, raised up occultic, born in the graveyard, born in the water. Some people are doing that now. They go underwater to give birth to their children, just to tell you the level of demonic manifestations. All right. So whatever, but all humans were created by God. The life Given spirit is who he is. He's the life-giving spirit, all right? But all humans are called to salvation also. So minister of God, when you condemn an ethnic group, condemn a race and say they are the devils, you're going to answer to God on that because his word is very clear. Verse 17, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. So God is not in the business of condemnation. He's in the business of salvation. God's love is to all humans. So when you hate any particular humans, you're not of God, you're not representing God, point blank. And God's plan of salvation is for all humans. So when you exclude any particular set of humans from salvation, you're not acting on behalf of God. God is not in the business of condemnation. When you condemn humans or condemn any ethnic group, any race, right, any demography, you're not representing God. God is in the business of salvation not in the business of condemning anyone. And we must also realize, have you thought about this? Think about this. It was a huge task for God to get these Jewish believers to accept Gentiles. <laughs> when we did the book of Acts, we saw that. They, they wouldn't, because they, 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 in fact, I'm gonna, when we get to Acts 10, uh, 10, 28, I'll read it to you, but let me just go on. It was, a, it was a huge task to get the Jewish believers to accept Gentiles to begin with. Some of them struggle with the thought. Remember Peter, Simon, had the dream? Oh, Lord, nothing unclean has entered his mouth. So he said, God said, don't call unclean what I have cleansed, okay? So, but the Holy Spirit insisted, this is the way of God. 
The Holy Spirit is showing us the way of God. Are you going to hold on to your traditions? Are you going to hold on to your belief system? Or are you going to follow the way of the Spirit? Acts 10, 28. Then Simon said to them, you know how unlawful it was sent to the house of Cornelius. You, can you imagine the people you're coming to preach to and you're first telling them tradition? Now you guys know I shouldn't be here in the first place because our law, the Jewish law does not permit me to be speaking to you guys. Ah, wow. So it was a huge task. So I get it. When some ministers cannot embrace other ethnic groups, you are not the only one. These guys dealt with it. The Holy Spirit dealt with it in, the, in, the, in these Jewish believers. But Simon said, you know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Okay, so you're going to stand before God. <coughs> Peter here tells you, God showed him that I should not call any man, any man, any man. So you cannot call anyone on planet Earth unclean or unworthy of salvation. No, you should not do that. <coughs> so with respect to the systems of the world, let's now look at some other prophecies that deal with issues pertaining to the systems of the world. I want you to observe here how Christ, his apostles, and eventually we're going to find an archangel classified the systems of this world. We are here killing ourselves jamming our heads, fighting one another, calling names, you know, literally wiping people out from the book of life because they don't agree with our political affiliation. They don't say what we say verbatim. So we say there are no more children of God. There are no more apostles. You know, they, they are false prophets because they don't agree with our political ideology. But I want you to see how Christ, how his apostles, and how even an archangel classified the systems of this world that you are defending, the systems of this world that you're pursuing about, the systems of this world that you're clamoring for, how does God classify them? <clears throat> All right, John 18, 36. Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. So Jesus made a delineation between the kingdom that he represents versus the existing or pre-existing kingdom or pre-existing system. So Jesus says, I have a system, I have a government, I have an administration that is totally different from this one. Mine is not the same as this. Mine does not come from this. Mine is not this. So the kingdom church must settle this matter. If you say Christ is your king, then your king and the head of the church just said, my kingdom is different. And you cannot change that position. You cannot change that position. So it's either we move away from that position and say, okay, I don't agree with Christ. We must fight for the land. It must be our land, our land, our land. You're going to die one day and leave the land. The earth is the Lord's, right? The earth belongs to him. doesn't belong to him. All we do is we, 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 we lease it. That's really what we're doing. We lease the earth, we lease the land. One generation passes, another generation comes. Wars happen, even the, the topography of the earth changes. Climate changes things, right? Catastrophe happens and the whole thing changes. A new generation comes and starts all over again, but you're dying over land. It is my, in my land, my land. And because of that, you're losing things of eternal value. So we can either move away from Christ's position or we can align ourselves with Christ. All right, here is the next one. <clears throat> three different times, and this is critical, by the mouth of two or three witnesses, a word is established. And this is coming from none other than the Lord Jesus himself, who is the truth. Three different times, the Lord Jesus refers to an entity he describes as ruler of the world. John chapter 12, verse 31. John 14, verse 30. First one is John chapter 12. And verse 31, John 12, 31, John 14 and verse 30, and then John 16, verse 11. Jesus refers to a, an entity that he describes as the ruler of this world. Now, it's either language doesn't mean anything, or Jesus is saying there's a ruler over this world that is not him. <clears throat> either, either language has lost its meaning 
whether you want to look at it from Greek or from Hebrew or from Aramaic, it's going to mean the same thing. It's either Jesus is saying, it's either language has lost its meaning or Jesus is saying there is a ruler <clears throat> over this world that is not me, not Christ. So Christ is not the ruler of this world, of this war system. He is the only, he's the heir over the earth, no doubt. The father owns it all, but it's been taken over. And you know the story, can't go into all of that. That is Jesus's position, all right? Now question, has that changed? Because some people might say, oh, that was before he went to the cross. After he died on the cross, he changed. Okay, you got to show me where it says that in scripture. That is no longer, you know, he's now the ruler of this world, right? No, what he keeps saying is, I'm, I'm, I'm going to prepare a place for you. When I come, I will establish a kingdom. That's what we see. He didn't say he rules this world, all right? And if that has not changed, then that statement has huge implications for God's people, we've got to evaluate because it pertains to all who are members of the kingdom of God. All right, that was Jesus. Here is his apostle, Paul. Second Corinthians four, verse three and four. Even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds, observe, the God of this age has blinded who do not believe least the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. So Paul refers to an entity that he describes as the God of this age. Was he referring to Christ? And this was after the resurrection of Christ. So Paul didn't get the memo that anything changed. Paul did not get the memo that the resurrection of Christ, the ascension of Christ changed the dynamics of things. No, he kept speaking about a God of this age. And this God of this age is, is described as one who keeps people from embracing God's agenda for salvation. See that? So when people refuse to embrace the light of God, Paul says there's a God that is doing that. The God of this age keeps them in darkness. And here's the problem with that. When people are sent into national leadership roles who are alienated from the light of God, who are bound by the God of this age, so they are in the darkness of the God of this age, guess what? They bring their darkened perspectives to the office. Simple. They've been alienated from the light of God, alienated from the, you know, from the, from the, uh, 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 from the, power, from the light of God, the grace of God, but they are overshadowed by the God of this age and the darkness that he brings with him. What does that mean then? It means they bring that darkened perspective to leadership roles. So what should the kingdom church do? We must engage with the light of God. The only thing that defeats darkness is light. You cannot bring darkness to fight darkness. <clears throat> you cannot try to get worse than them. You cannot try to make your voice louder than their voice. We have seen here in the United States, we had, we had a, a president who thought it was the best posture was to, you know, uh, 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 fire for fire. Oh my God, it brought the worst that we've ever seen. And now the nation, we're, we're reeling to and fro like a drunken man, still trying to find our feet, right? Good intentions, great policies, but personality was an issue. And so he thought he could go against the other side, fire for fire. They have been doing that. Let me give it back to them. Got to fight back. Oh my God. He just unveiled. It's like unleashed <laughs> what we've never seen before. So again, I want to say to you, Minister of God, when you go that route, it's, it's like, it's like a, a snake spits at you and then you're spitting back at the snake. Okay. Who, who's, don't you know it's going to be worse on you? Right? No. We fight darkness with light because the God of this age brings darkness. The only way to defeat that is to bring the light of God. I'll leave it at that. Now, here's the, the one I was talking about, Revelation 17. I'm going to read from verse 1 to 9. I want you to follow this plot and see what's going on here. Verse 1, then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me. You got to understand when you, when you read the earlier chapters. So the introduction of this angel is that he's one of the uh, seven angels who brings the judgment of the seven bowls. 
And the judgment of the seven bulls essentially judged the kingdom of darkness. In, in fact, it judged the, 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 the kingdom of the, the beast. It judged the beast, essentially Satan's kingdom. So we're dealing with an archangel here who has been assigned to bring judgment to the kingdom of darkness. So he knows what he's talking about. He knows what he's talking about. So he comes to John and say, come, I will show you the judgment. See that? I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, all right? So there's a predetermined judgment over this harlot of a person, of an entity, but she sits over many waters. And waters, of course, are peoples, nations, tongues, and tribes. You know that already. Verse 2, watch this, child of God, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication. So this archangel is saying to John, the kings of your worldly system, the kings of your earth. And by the way, when it says kings, it's not just the kings of ancient times. It's talking about all your leadership roles, presidents, potentates, blah, blah, blah. They've all committed fornication with this entity. Ah, yeah, yeah. All right. So they've all committed fornication with this entity. And so because of that, the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of our fornication. So the decisions these kings made after having fornication with this entity causes drunken stupor upon the whole earth. So this prophecy pertains to the whole earth, pertains to all humanity, pertains to human, human existence. Can you see that? You are talking about Nigeria, prophecy for Nigeria, prophecy for America, prophecy for China. Now I'm talking about what pertains to the whole earth. This has greater weight. Right, verse 3. So the angel carried John away in the spirit into the wilderness. This is a prophetic futuristic vision now. Takes him into a place and begins to show him the judge. Because I'm going to show you the judgment of this woman. She's not judged now, but I'm taking you to when she's judged. Right? So he takes him there. And John, first and foremost, sees a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Don't have time. The, the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the fieldiness of her fornication. And then verse five tells us on her forehead, a name was written, please watch this. Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. So when you talk about the abominations of the earth, the archangel was showing John, this is the source. This is where it comes from. This is the one who is in charge of it all, right? He goes on verse six, John saw the woman drunk, watch this, with the blood of the saint. Oh, they are killing our people. They are killing Christians. God knows that. This woman is orchestrating the killing of God's people, the killing of the prophets of God, the killing of the saints, and the blood of the murders of Jesus. God knows about a child of God. He sees it, he knows it, and he's telling you where he came from, the source of it, right? And when John saw her, he marveled greatly. Now, I don't have time, but the angel now spoke to John and said, why did you marvel? That's my key. Saints of God, why are you marveled at these things? Why are you perturbed at these things? Why are you baffled at these things? Why are you concerned about these things? Why do these things throw you off balance? That's what the archangel is saying. These things are meant to happen. Unfortunately, our place is to call men unto salvation. Call people unto salvation to the best of our ability. Preach the kingdom of God. Preach the light of God. Preach salvation in Christ. But these things are bound to happen. Why are you marveled at it? Why does it put you in a position where you become so angry that you take decisions that are not of God, right? Verse eight, I got to move on. The beast that you saw was, and it's not, uh, no, what am I saying? Okay, yeah, so I'm going to verse nine. Uh, and those who dwell on the earth will marvel. Like you just marvel, John, you're not supposed to, apostles of God, you're not supposed to marvel. Prophets of God, you're not supposed to marvel. Saints of God, you're not supposed to marvel. Don't let these things bamboozle you. Don't let them bedazzle you. What a marvel positively or marvel negatively, you should have no affairs with these things at all. All right, I, I, I got to go to verse 9 for time's sake. Look at what it says in verse 9. Here is the mind which has wisdom. So the question is, where is the mind that has wisdom? Don't forget, like I said on Sunday, the spirit is called the spirit of wisdom and revelation. We cling to revelation, but where is wisdom? This is wisdom. The spirit of wisdom and revelation. The spirit of wisdom and revelation is speaking, but it speaks wisdom first 
before revelation. In fact, revelation is undergirded by wisdom. Here is wisdom. Are we going to receive it? Or are we going to throw it away and keep doing what we're doing? But here is wisdom from the mouth of an archangel who has been assigned to judge mystery Babylon eventually. It's not in your hands. Your 100 days fasting is not going to do it. God has already prepared judgment for the harlots by this archangel. And the angel is giving us insight into divine wisdom. Here is wisdom. What is it? The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. When you look at it at the surface, it doesn't make sense. But here's what the angel is saying. I want you to understand that the seven mountains have been overtaken by mystery Babylon. So when you climb off of these things, understand you are working for mystery Babylon. <clears throat> you are really, when, when you make your focus, the seven mountains. And the seven mountains, again, are the pillars of society. I've talked about this in the past, right? It's governance, uh, it, it, it's, 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 um, it's art, it's science and technology, spirituality, it, it, it's, it's, it's commerce, it's academia, right? All of these things have, have greatly influenced human societies, all right? And, but this, this woman has taken them over, and you can see very clearly, it's taking it over our academia now, my God, indoctrination. All right, can't stay on that. But the angel says, servants of God, John, and your brothers and your sisters, it's wisdom for you to know that the seven mountains have been taken over by mystery Babylon. So stop pursuing these things. If God puts you there by his divine orchestration, use it to the best of your ability. Do what you got to do, civil responsibility, your civic duties, you know, preach, pray, vote, but don't kill yourself for this stuff. So this is what humanity is dealing with. No matter your uh, ethnic group, right, your race, your nation, your gender, your religion, your political affiliation, or your status in life, this is what we're dealing with. <clears throat> we're dealing with this mystery Babylon and a wine of abominations. The kings of the earth, the merchants of the earth, they've all drunk, he says. And so they've caused the whole earth to be drunken in the wine of our fornication. And by the way, democracy cannot deal with this. This is a spiritual matter. Only divine judgment can. Finally, Revelation 21, verse 1 to 5. Revelation 21, verse 1 to 5. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. <clears throat> Verse 4, and God will wipe away watch this, every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. This is the only time, saints of God, that we can expect global peace. So by you saying, oh, cessation, if we go our separate ways, we will have peace. You're lying. It's a lie. It's not going to happen because the earth has been judged. The earth is doomed. The God of this world, mystery Babylon, is turmoil, is war everywhere, death all over the place, all right? The only kingdom, the only nation, the only government, the only administration that will establish peace and bliss is the kingdom of Christ. That is why we invite those who are not yet saved. Come to the Lord Jesus. Come to the Lord Jesus before it's too late. Come to the Lord Jesus before it's too late. It's only in him that we can find true peace. So when the government literally rests on the shoulders of Yeshua, the Lord Jesus, that is when we can have true peace, true joy, and true love. All right? On the earth, the new earth. We can have foretaste of it right now as we embrace his presence. So again, ministers of God, the yoke is broken by the anointing. It is the anointing that is our strength. The anointing is our advantage. It's not democracy. It's not carrying placard. It's not your protest. Protest as a function of your civil responsibility. You can do that. But don't think that is what will solve mystery Babylon's problem. It's not. 
must stand our place as the kingdom church using the keys of the kingdom. We're going to talk about that on Sunday so that we can bind and lose what God has bound and what God has loosed. Amen and amen. So on Sunday, we shall look into that some more and that will be revisiting our divinely ordained call and identity. Lord, we give you praise. Thank you, Lord, for your word. And today we pray that your word has gone forth <clears throat> according to the grace that you supplied. Let understanding be given. Let illumination come forth. May your people embrace your word, O oh God, and bring glory to your name. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You stay blessed. Until, <coughs> excuse me, until we come your way again shortly. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.